Actually, it has been one big weekend. And I'm drawing to a conclusion, a little mini-series that we've been running through. This is week four of four weeks of looking at the Easter weekend, if you like, but looking at the whole story of Easter. Good Friday was a day of remorse when Jesus died on the cross. And this is one explanation that was given. The chief priests and our rulers handed Jesus over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You sense there the thoughts really of, well, how's that going to happen? He is dead. Remorse, sorrow, tears, regret, disappointment, grief. Holy Saturday was a day of rest when Jesus' body lay in the tomb. And the women who had come up with Jesus from Galilee, they followed Joseph, they saw the tomb, and how his body was laid in it. And then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the command. So Holy Saturday became a day of rest, of quiet, of silence, of reflection, maybe wondering, maybe waiting, a day of uncertainty. Until, of course, Easter Sunday arrives, and Easter Sunday is Resurrection Day, and the declaration is made by the angels, He is not here. He has risen. And Sunday is a day of resurrection, a day of power, a day of glory, a day of hope, a day of joy. And if we reflect on those three days in that way, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, it really does beg the question that I'm handling this morning is when it comes to Monday, what next? What happens now? Where do we go? What do we do? What do we say? Now what? And I'm going to read from Luke 23 because we focused our thoughts in the Gospel of Luke particularly. And uh, if I said Luke 23, I meant Luke 24. <laughs> Did I say 23? Why does that happen? You look at a number and you say a different one. Does, or am I the only one that that happens to? It says 24, and I say 23. Anyway, that's a distraction. Luke 24 is where I really want to be. And this is starting our reading for this morning at verse 36. And uh, you've got to just imagine the setting, really. The, the disciples, the followers of Jesus are together, and they've seen Jesus die, and they're hearing stories rumors, incredible things that they don't understand, can't really believe, to be honest. And while they were together, still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why? Are you troubled? And why do doubts rise up in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, 
Because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of boiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And when he had left them, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. I wish I was there. The disciples clearly had been on a roller coaster of emotions. And when Jesus appeared to them, they were surprised, afraid, troubled, full of doubts, and confusion. And in amidst those emotions and those feelings that were in them and in their hearts, Jesus gave to them a revelation about himself. This same Jesus was the one they had been with for the last three years. This same Jesus who had died on the cross. And he invited them to look at his hands and his feet. And surely that was that they might see the nail prints. This is the same Jesus. The one we've been with, we've walked with, we've listened to. The one we saw die on the cross. This is the same Jesus. And this same Jesus who had died was now alive, risen from death. And Jesus said to the disciples, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. This same Jesus had been prophesied. And the events of the weekend were a direct fulfillment of the scriptures. And this is what I told you, Jesus said to them, while I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. And now the disciples are experiencing joy and amazement. Not surprised at that. And yet it was still hard to really believe what was right in front of their eyes. And yet, how could they doubt what they were seeing and what they were hearing? And Jesus said to them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And of course, he had emphasized that this was what he had already told them before. When he was with the disciples prior to the cross, before death on the cross. When I was with you, when we walked, you can imagine him saying, don't you remember when we were walking along the way and I told you this? This is what I told you while I was still with you. And if we jump back in time from this point, Let's pop into Matthew, for example. 
And what does Matthew record in his account? Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. But at that time, as Jesus was explaining to his disciples, this is what is going to happen, they did not understand. They were hearing with their ears, but their hearts and their minds just could not understand. Jesus, what are you telling us? In fact, Peter, being one of those disciples, he actually took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. But now it's different. Their minds have gained understanding. And Jesus opened their minds to what the Scripture had written, to the prophecies that were given, and to what they had seen for themselves over this big weekend. And I find it interesting, Luke 24 draws our attention to three things that were opened. The first is obvious, the tomb. There was Jesus buried in a tomb, a huge stone rolled across the entrance. And we are told in Luke 24 verse 2, that when the women came to the tomb, they found that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. So there's one thing that had been opened, the tomb. But secondly, there were two on their way to Emmaus, and they were talking amongst themselves, and Jesus came alongside them and spoke with them. They didn't know who it was, they didn't recognize him, and were told specifically that their eyes were open. This is Luke 24, verse 31. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. An open tomb, opened eyes. And then in the scripture that we've read today, opened minds. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Now, let's try and be there with them. I mean, they're excited, they're amazed, they're full of happiness at what they're now seeing. And I kind of wonder, what do the disciples want to do now? I mean, there is joy at being with the risen Jesus, there is amazement at all the things that they had both seen and heard. There is understanding now in their minds, in their hearts. They're beginning to grasp what this means. And I just imagine them kind of all pumped up and excited and highly motivated and actually ready for action. I mean, they're keen to do something with this amazing revelation of Jesus. I mean, what, I don't know, what they probably didn't know, but can you just imagine how they were feeling and perhaps the energy that was rising in them? We've got to do something with this. And they're just pumped up for action. We've got to do something. And then Jesus says to them, wait, what? Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. And I wonder how that landed with them. I don't know if you've been in situations where you're, 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 you know, the adrenaline is running and you're excited and you're ready to go and someone says to you, wait. And sometimes the energy kind of pours out of you, doesn't it? You think, what? I'm, I want to go. But no, the, Jesus said, I want you to wait. Stay in the city. And I guess we've got to acknowledge that strong emotions can give us a, a vitality, can give us an, an energy to take action. But emotional energy can be temporary and short-lived. And it's so variable because it depends on circumstances and moods. 
Emotions are not enough. We do a lot based on emotion. Whether we can be honest about that, I think we do. We do an awful lot based on how we're feeling at the time. The emotion we're experiencing. But they are unreliable. They're important, yeah. They're part of us, yes. God gave us emotions, yes. But they're not enough. Just not enough. Now, understanding the Word, having the Bible in our hands, reading it and memorizing it and learning it and, and understanding what it says, will give us a motivation to demonstrate God's love, to tell others about Jesus, to, to do something. But you know, understanding the Word is not enough. And Jesus was emphasizing to the disciples, look, you've got understanding now. And you're excited now. But that's not enough. There's something more. And Jesus knew that his followers needed the very power of God. With them and in them. And this is the power that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. Through God himself. And when you read the fulfillment now of this that Jesus has said to the disciples, look, you need power from on high. You will receive what the Father has promised. And this is leaping now forward in time. Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and suddenly there was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were able to speak. Now they were able to do something. But they had to wait. They needed the Holy Spirit. So that's one word for us just to remember that waiting for the Holy Spirit, waiting upon the Holy Spirit, if we're not prepared to do those, um, what we do will be weak and will be lessened and will be in our own strength. But we need the very power of the Spirit of God upon us and in us. So the disciples waited in obedience to the instruction that Jesus had given them. But what I do love about this is they did not wait in a vacuum. This wait was not do nothing. There wasn't a vacuum of something to do. And what did they do in the waiting? What did they do while they were waiting for this to be fulfilled? And we read, they worshipped. And I love this. Then they worshipped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Can you see, they're doing what Jesus told them. Stay in the city. And they did. But in the staying, in the waiting, it wasn't empty. It wasn't a vacuum. It wasn't devoid of something, anything, they used the opportunity and they used their energy and they used the time to worship Jesus and to praise God. And I think that's a really helpful and important thing for us to learn, that in times of waiting for us, there is still something we can do. And worshipping God almost feels like that's the least we can do. But it doesn't have to be an empty space. So there's a second word for us to hold on to. There's, there's the wait and there's the worship. But Jesus had told his disciples to wait until they had received the Holy Spirit. And this waiting and now this receiving was to serve a very specific purpose that Jesus had for his followers. He wanted them to be his witnesses. And so Jesus says, yes, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to all nations, 
beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Isn't it interesting? He's saying that this is what's going to happen. People are going to hear about me. And people are going to repent of their sin. They're going to turn from their sin. They're going to follow me. And do you know how that's going to happen? You. You're my witnesses. And Jesus was sending his disciples into all the world. Aren't you glad he did that? How would we have heard? How would we ever have known if they didn't do this? The disciples needed to be filled with the Spirit. And isn't it interesting that actually that was the only thing Jesus asked them to wait for. He did not ask them to wait until they had obtained a degree in theology. However good that might be, it wasn't wait in the city and study, learn, get your degree, get your education, increase your intelligence of the whole story. It wasn't that instruction, it wasn't that to wait for, nor was it Wait until your lives are sorted. Guys, you're pretty messed up in spite of the three years we've been together. I mean, he could so easily have pointed at Peter and said, Peter, you even denied knowing me. And actually all of you ran away and deserted me. And there wasn't a sense of, I want you to wait until your lives are all sorted out and and you've reached a certain level, that's when I want you to be my witnesses. It wasn't wait for that. It wasn't wait for my emotions to be all settled and I'm all happy and I'm okay. It wasn't wait for that. It wasn't wait for anything other than wait until you're clothed with power and that by the Holy Spirit. And he sent them out as they were, lives probably far from sorted. Did they really have a full understanding of everything? I doubt it. Were their emotions now in a more settled state? I don't think so. But he sent them out. He wanted them to go, as they were, but filled with the Holy Spirit. I just wonder, how many times do we wait for something until we do something? And we're waiting for the wrong thing. Oh, it's not necessarily the wrong thing, but we don't need to wait. We can still be witnesses to Jesus Christ. And Jesus commissioned his disciples And we can easily pop over to the end of Matthew for that great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. And this great commission is one that has been passed on to us. In fact, it's there. He says it there. He commands his disciples to go into the world and make disciples. But when you do that, tell them, tell these new disciples that they are to do the same. I want them to obey this same commandment. I'm telling you to go into the world and I expect them to go into the world. So I want you to teach them to obey what I have taught you. And this commission wasn't just to the disciples at that time. It's a commission that we all have received. The big weekend is over. The remorse of Good Friday, the rest of Holy Saturday, The resurrection of Easter Sunday. 
And I guess we do love the expression, Sunday is coming, when we use it in this context. On our Good Friday, on our dark days, on our bad days, on our painful days, on our hurting days, for a Christian, the phrase Sunday is coming means something, doesn't it? Don't you sometimes even use those words, but right now, where I am, life is rubbish, I'm struggling. But do you know, I hold on to this one thing, Sunday is coming. I'm looking to Resurrection Day. I'm looking to victory in this situation. I'm looking to power when I feel weak. I'm looking to the risen Saviour. Sunday is coming. And we love that. We need that. Rightfully so. But and I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up because there are other meanings to this phrase. But who loves the phrase, Monday is coming? <laughs> we tend not to, do we? But Monday is coming. And to me, I'm just using this as an expression of Monday is a day of energy, of, of motivation, of being full of the Spirit of God, of going to my friends and my family and showing them what Jesus looks like by the life I live, my behaviours, my attitudes, the values I hold to, even the words that I speak to them. I am his witness and I want them to come to know him. And I'm the person for the job, to be honest. I've been commissioned by Jesus himself. But look at me, look at my life. Would you choose me to do this? You wouldn't, but Jesus did. He didn't wait till I was settled, so nor do I. He didn't say, wait till you've got everything. So I don't have to wait for that. But I do need a spirit. And I'm motivated, and that's what this Monday is all about. I understand the dread of Monday morning going to work. But hey, isn't that where God's called us to be? And to be His witnesses? Monday's a good day. I'm going to invite you to join me in a response to this summing up of this big weekend. I focused really on the Monday, but I wanted to draw along with me the Friday and the Saturday and the Sunday as well. And I wonder this. If the days of the Easter weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday, if they describe where we are right now, then which day are you living right now, today? And maybe you're thinking, well, actually, to be honest, Derek, I am on Friday right now. That's the day I'm living because life is rubbish. I'm as weak as anything. Don't tell me about Monday. I'm on Friday, thank you. And I need to get through this. And I'm struggling, I'm suffering. It's pretty hard, it's pretty rubbish. And that's just where I am. And for others, it could be your thinking, do you know, I, I'm nowhere near Monday. I'm Saturday, to be honest. I feel a bit lost. I, I feel a bit unsure, uncertain. I've got some doubts. And, and I feel as though I, I, I'm in the waiting room. And, and there is quiet and there is silence. I pray, but I don't hear God's voice. And that's where I am. I'm on Saturday. And others might feel, do you know, I've been through Friday and Saturday. I'm on Sunday. Do you know, life is okay, actually. Just now. Life is okay. I'm happy enough. I'm healthy enough. I, I'm okay enough. And to me, Resurrection Day with its power and its glory, that's just where I am. And that is the day I'm living. And I wonder how many would be brave to say, I'm on Monday. 
I'm pumped up. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. We're afraid to say that sometimes. I don't know why. Is it, does it feel arrogant? Does it feel as though, huh, I'm okay, mate? But it's okay to be full of the Spirit of God. And it's okay to be strong. It's okay to be happy. And it's okay to be highly motivated. And it's okay to know that this afternoon you're going to spend time with family. And this is your opportunity to show Jesus to them. They don't know him yet. But you're going to show him to them in whatever way you can that is relevant because you know them. You know how they tick. You know what works. You know what not to say as well as what to say. And you're pumped up for that. And that's just where you are. And I wonder where any of us in this room are. Friday, Saturday, Sunday or Monday. And don't get me wrong, I don't see that as a linear passage of life. I don't think it's we've got to move from Friday into Saturday into Sunday and then into Monday. And hopefully by the time I'm the age of Gene Smith, I might be in on a Monday. It's not like that. Because believe me, you can be on Monday and next week you might find yourself right back into Saturday. Isn't that true? Isn't that true of our lives? It's not a progression from Friday to, to Monday. To be honest, you might experience all four days in one week. That's possible. But I'm just using this as a helpful expression to get our heads around one and honesty of just where we are right now.